it's really just the entire you know genre of physical media that is so appealing to me you know and that's why that's why what we do what we do <laughs> we are here at the game developers conference where i had a chance to speak with joe and demetrius from limited run games my chat with joe and demetrius who you may know as modern vintage gamer on youtube covered so many topics about the game industry we started off by talking about their effort to bring classic games to modern consoles using emulation at the heart of this is their custom game engine carbon I feel like there's a lot of misinformation out there about what an engine actually does. Yes. And uh, I, would, I would love if you guys could shed some light on that. He'll, he'll tell you better than I uh, I think you're going to get a variety of different answers from people, but ultimately I think the most simple answer is an, an engine is just a development environment used to help you make games, right? People have this idea now with the popularity of engines like Game Maker, Unity, Unreal, that an engine has to help, has to be something that you can use to make any kind of game, but that's not really true. For the history of game development, there have been proprietary engines designed to do maybe one genre or one type of thing. So our engine is designed to optimize emulation and be modular and uh, support emulators working on modern platforms, right? Um, in many ways, it is, a, it is a game development tool set or environment that is just designed to interface with emulators as opposed to other types of code, right? It's an engine, in, I guess, in the traditional sense, but it's also um, an internally developed thing where it's basically just focused for the, our development team. So it's not, it's not the traditional kind of, um, you know, when you talk about engines like Unity and Unreal, there's a, um, a, you know, there's a public um, interface where you know, anyone can download it and play around with it. Obviously, this is much more tailored to the types of games that we're trying to bring out with limited run games. So it's more of a customized uh, thing that we use in, internally. A question I had about the Carbon Engine is uh, what led to its development? There must have been some moment where you were like, okay, we, we need to have this standardized, we need to do something. I mean, Joe can talk more about how Carbon, kind of the genesis of Carbon, how we started, but um, basically from my perspective, Limited Run was looking for someone um, that was passionate about, you know, emulation, retro games, and and obviously someone that knew how to write code and and and, and understood software development, right? That could basically spearhead, you know, this new initiative that they had going on internally um, to bring back old retro games, right? Um, so that's really that's you know how it all started from my perspective. Our first game that we signed back in 2019 was Shante, um, which we worked with Way Forward on. And that was a Game Boy Color game. So we, we started building out the engine. We started building out the emulator to run, you know, Shantae uh, Game Boy Color. Um, and it's really just kind of gone from there. It's really just been, you know, very, very, very small, very fast, iterative type development. And it's just continued to, you know, to grow and grow and iterate um, to where we are, you know, today. As Demetra said, it did start with Shantae. Uh, so we have a great relationship with WayForward. And we've released a ton of different Shantae games, and we were finding that the only Shantae game that was not accessible and available anymore was the original, the original Game Boy Color release. And we wanted to provide a solution for that. And when we started exploring, you know, Josh and I exploring what that solution could be, uh, we came to realize that this is a need that many of our development partners have, a lot of publishers have, this need to release and distribute their back catalog of games that it's too expensive up front to go and do this, you know, 90 different times at a bunch of different companies. But what if we built something and we uh, front load all that expense and R&D ourselves and start doing that work for others? And that's kind of where the idea started was with our partner at Way Forward. We had engineers internally. Um, I was working on a lot of ports at Limited Run. So there were a lot of uh, partners we worked with that say they didn't have the capability to release a game on Switch or PlayStation 4 or Xbox or whatever. So we'd take their source code and then I would sit there and outport those games for them. And we offered that as a service for a while. But I didn't, despite being extremely into retro games, um, I've never had any experience working on emulation myself. I knew a ton about utilizing it, but not working on it. So we kind of took that combination of like, well, I have the skills to ship games, to see projects through to completion. I've done that on modern platforms for a while. I know what I'm doing there. This guy is extremely affluent and... Uh, emulation work so i reached out to him and carbon started with just the two of us working yeah. together and it was this tiny little thing in limited run that was just the two of us working on it for years before uh 
it kind of started to gain traction and became a bigger pillar of the company. Do you have a, a personal story about uh, like a physical game or game collection that means something to you that led you to want to work on this project? Mine is, uh, it might be a cheating answer, but um, where a lot of my passion for this stuff comes from is actually one of my own games. So uh, I was an indie developer before I worked for Limited Run, and uh, a lot of the origins of the company, it started from uh, a lot of indie developers. They got together and they were working on indie games, and then they turned into this publishing thing. And um, I was one of the games that was published in the first few years of the company, uh, my game Super Gun World 2. Limited Run put it out, and that got us communicating with each other, and after that it landed my job here. And that allowed me to help other indie developers achieve the same dream of getting their games physically preserved, right? So being able to help other developers achieve that, like it was done for me, was super important to me when I came to the company. And then to have been given the opportunity to grow in the company and pursue other avenues and start building things like the Carbon Engine um, has all been a great dream come true. So I think the most important like physical game for me is that, because it's kind of where my career went from this thing where I'm self-employed to a much bigger thing, right? So that was really important to me. I love physical media, right. and as someone that is really big on, um, you know, keeping physical products alive, that's really the best answer I can give you. Like, there's really no one specific game or example that really kind of, you know, embraces, you know, what you're asking. But it's really just the entire, you know, genre of physical media that is so appealing to me. You know, and that's why that's why what we do what we do. So you mentioned that he had a lot of experience in emulation. Can you? Speak to, you know, what were some of the emulation-related jobs that you have had before, or pro projects in general, jobs or not? So, no jobs before I joined Limited Run. In fact, I was never actually in the game industry before I joined Limited Run back in 2019, but it was always a passion that I wanted to get into video game, develop uh, in, into the industry, but it was, it's just that problem of, I don't know anyone in the industry, I, I have no contacts, I don't know where to start, but one of the things I've always been passionate about is emulation, and I've done a lot of homebrew uh, projects over the years. I've, I've worked on emulation uh, projects in a homebrew capacity for many, many years. I've worked with various open source development teams going back to like, you know, the early 2000s. So I've got a lot of experience and knowledge in the emulation field. I also know a lot of people in emulation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, they'll get me a job in the industry. So actually Joe reached out to me after watching one of my videos on, I think it was Diablo on yeah. the Switch. Uh, so I, I ended up just, it, was, it sounds crazy, but I ended up just porting Diablo to the Nintendo Switch in a homebrew capacity, so it was completely 100% unofficial. Yeah. Um, and I kind of forgot about it. I made a video on it, and it got a little bit of traction on, like, Kotaku and a couple of other kind of major websites. Um, and I kind of forgot about it for, like, six months, and then all of a sudden, Joe reached out and said, hey, um, you seem like a seem like you know what you're doing. Um, we're doing this initiative at Limited Run. Would you be interested in, in partnering together and... So that's kind of how it all started. So no no formal emulation development experience before LRG, but obviously many, many years of, of working on emulate emulation type open source projects. One question that came to mind, I, I work with students. Uh, sometimes I teach video editing and video production at the university level. And, uh, you know, they ask me all the time, you know, what advice do you have for getting into the industry? And I'm curious, throw that same question at, at you, you know, different industry, but... Uh, what advice would you have for uh, uh, somebody who wants to break in? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really tough right now. As you probably know, there's been so many layoffs in the industry. It's very, very difficult. But I would say that, number one, no, you know, keep pushing forward. Don't stop. But, I mean, to be a little more granular than that, I would say um, have a portfolio of your work. You know, if you have GitHub, uh, GitHub uh, you know, page with, with your work, um, promote it, you know, show it off. Like, the way that I got recognized was I made videos of the work that I was doing on YouTube. And I just kind of made them all for myself as more of an archival thing to kind of just show the progress I was making. So I never really ended up being something that I felt like was going to get so, many, so much attention on me. So I would say do something that makes you, makes you stand out from everyone else. Um, whether, that you, whether that is you have a portfolio of your work that you're very, very proud of whether um, you have like an itch.io page that you want to promote, whether you have GitHub or whether you have YouTube or take advantage of social media, take advantage of LinkedIn. I think, I feel like LinkedIn is one of the most underrated websites or social media platforms that a lot of developers simply just ignore because they don't really feel, they, they kind of seem like, they, they feel like it's more a, a, a business kind of website or just, you know, but there's a lot of things that happen on, on LinkedIn as well. So 
get your name out there, I think is, is really the, you know, the, the short answer. I would say I actually really want to add to what Demetrius said. Um, say, do something to stand out, right? Uh, it can take a while to figure out what it is that makes you stand out. So my, my advice would be until you know what's going to make you stand out, just do something. Yeah. Um, a job's never just going to fall into your lap just because you could potentially be great at it or you could potentially have like all that potential. Yeah. It doesn't just happen, right? Um, everybody's path into the industry is very different. This is a very non-formal industry in a lot of ways. And I would say that the first step is to just do something. You know, I didn't uh, have this opportunity to just fall in my lap out of nowhere. I had to work really, really hard and as an indie developer uh, for many years before this opportunity came along. And the opportunity didn't just come along out of nowhere, they saw what I was doing and, and that meant something, right? And for Demetrius, you know, I, I found him because of the YouTube content he was doing and I realized he'd be a great asset to our team, right? Um, so just start with do something. If there's something you're interested in or passionate about, do something for yourself. Get that stuff out there. It's going to build your skills. It may seem like you're doing it for nothing because you're not being paid, but you you can be paid in things that aren't money for some time until those opportunities come, right? And that's not meant to be a like, oh, do things just for the experience and the exposure kind of thing, because that's really predatory. It's more just do things for yourself to help you grow, challenge yourself, express yourself. You will find what your path is there, what your best skills are there. And then you can start applying those more publicly so you find, you know, or you find someone or they find you. I think game jams is a real big one. Uh, so every, every town in the country is, has some type of developer community, whether that is two people, 10 people, 100 people. And there's always like game jams that I keep hearing about that, that's going on, whether that is like a 48 hour one or a week long one, get, get involved. You know, if there is a local IGDA community or if there is a local developer community, get, get active, get more involved in those things because they can only benefit you in the long terms. And how do you feel about GDC as uh, a, a way for people to show off their stuff and network? Is, is this a good event to be able to do that? Generally speaking, yes, it is. Uh, this year is kind of very different because I don't think, um, you know, there's obviously been a lot of layoffs in the industry. And to be completely honest, I don't think that many people at GDC or many companies are looking for, for work. But I would say don't be discouraged by that. Uh, generally speaking, I think GDC is a really good place to, to, to meet people face to face and then pitch your game or show off what you're working on. Uh, it's way better than doing it over like uh, the internet, for example. Right. But yeah, in general, GDC is is a really good place, especially with kind of the death of E3, those kind of um, you know one to one, in person meetings and 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 things like that. You know, they're slowly starting to shrink, which is I think it's a shame, right? Because you know traditionally there's always been GDC, uh, E3, Dice, and Gamescom, and now we're kind of I mean Dice is not really the, the, the right place to kind of pitch, you know, your game to a publisher. So we're starting to, that kind of is starting to shrink. So I think GDC now has really a lot more importance to, you know, attend these types of shows and to, you know, to, you know, to talk to people face to face and pitch your games. My advice on that, as far as GDC is concerned, uh, GDC isn't the right show to approach, like just to come here and expect that you're going to walk up to people and just talk to them. Uh, this is a show where people come and they've got a they've got a pro, well, they've got a plan. They've got priorities. They've got meetings. People come to GDC, especially the people you're going to want to talk to, publishers, other developers. Uh, they're book solid. A lot of those people aren't even spending time on the show floor, right? Um, they're here to take part in meetings on the show floor, at the hotels, everywhere, right? Just because everyone's here for this period of time. Um, so coming to GDC, as Demetrius said, is very important. But you want to make sure you communicate with people in advance. Right. If there's anyone you want to talk to, you want to reach out in advance, set up meetings, make sure you got a schedule. If you just show up here with a smile and like good intentions, you're not going to get to talk to the people you really want to talk to. And it can feel like you've wasted an extremely valuable opportunity because you didn't prepare for it. Um, aside from that, uh, PAX. PAX is huge. If you got local events, those are great too, but PAX is huge. Having a booth at PAX where you can just have a little small table and show off your game, obviously going to be great. Uh, if you have something that's like tailored to specific interests like retro, right? You know, a lot of people make indie games that are super retro focused. If you're doing something indie there, go to something like Portland Retro Gaming Expo, something where you're going to find an audience that's tailored to what you're building and just go from there. Can you guys tell me a little bit about a challenge that you've faced while developing one of the games for limited run? 
worked on River City Girls Zero. So we this was a game that was only released in Japan. And we had to provide a new localized version of it for a lot of... We supported a lot of languages for that game. Um, editing a Super Nintendo ROM to adjust uh, characters for text. Hey, look, these games didn't work in a way where it's like, oh, here's just strings of text that you type out, right? Um, all of the texts are tile images. So editing it to support a different language, um, changing how many text boxes appear to uh, fit longer or shorter, you know, uh, word lengths. Very complicated, a lot more complicated than you would think, a lot more complicated than if you're doing it in a modern engine. There were there were things like, hey, if we made it so this, this conversation was now eight text boxes instead of five, now all of the, the teleporters that take you between screens don't take you to the right screens anymore. It messes up all these values in the ROM. So that was a really complicated one. It took a lot, a lot of testing and QA to, um, and reverse engineering to make that work. I have one I can talk about. So we did uh, extreme sports with uh, WayForward, and there was a particular stage in the game where um, the character was on an airplane ready to do the, the skydiving uh, stage, and the propellers of the actual airplane were flickering so hard that it would cause burn-in on the switch screen, which is something obviously that Nintendo uh, doesn't want you to do, so they, you know, they would basically kick it back to you and tell you to fix it. But because it is emulation, we don't have that much control over some of the things that we can do as far as graphics go. The solution was just to wait a couple of seconds and then just force a button press if the player hadn't pressed the button during that time, and then just gonna start the stage, you know, automatically. We did that and it worked great and yeah, um, they they proved it and, and the game's been shipped. So that was that was probably one of the biggest ones that, that I could recall. As an addition to that story, I think that's one of the fun examples of uh, why diversity in teams is so important and why game development requires so many different types of minds. Um, so I'm a programmer too, but I'm, I consider myself a gameplay programmer, a junior level gameplay programmer. I, I learned enough code to be able to make the games I wanted to make as an indie. But this man's an engineer. He's a true software engineer in a level that I can't match, right? Um, but it can be funny when we have problems like that because I remember the long conversations we had about this issue. Yeah. And a lot of your uh, your ideas were so overthought. <laughs> and I was the one that said, well, Demetrius, why don't we just literally put a timer yeah. and it forces a button press to get out of this. And you're like, oh, my God. Yeah. Because I think my initial idea was maybe replacing the graphics or the tiles or yeah. you were yeah. way out yeah, or, or like, you use a safe state or something but in the end yeah we 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 used the simplest idea and it worked and it was was awesome but yeah in hindsight you know we laugh about it now but at the time it was it was like well what do we do how do we fix this but joe obviously was was right and just just automate the automate the the, the stage simple solutions sometimes it's always best thank you thank you it's great to meet you yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you great to meet you thanks for time.